to come outside and play. She loved to do hair. You know, she was beginning to start doing hair. And she loved to see beauty. She liked the lights of beauty, beautiful things. She wasn't a bad girl. How did you find out about her death? How did I find out? Yeah. Well, I lived just right here. Mm-hmm. And um, I heard two shots. And when I heard the two shots, my two kids was um, on the porch. So I was sitting to the table eating my supper at the time. And I take it and um, ran to the door. And so my daughter said, uh, make, them, uh, make the kids come in. So I told my son and my granddaughter to come in the house. So as they came in the house, I sat back down. So some told me to get up and go look out the window. So I just came to my window right there and looked out. And so I saw my son, you know, prancing back and forth, you know, saying, call the police, call the police. And so then I ran out the back door with my shoes off. And he said, somebody's daughter is laying down here hurt. So, you know, I don't care who child is, I want to help. So I ran out the back door and ran right here. And I still didn't know it was my niece laying down there. And so my brother, he ran out the door and he, he, he ran right there. And then he, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that he knew it was his daughter. I'm pretty sure that my brother knew what she had on, her clothing. So he ran and he looked at her and he put his hand on her and felt her pus. So he said, she still have a pus. So he said, call the police. The police were there so quick. I mean, they was here on the arrival. And so um, the police, they came and put white gloves on and they felt my niece, you know, but I knew, you know, she wasn't gonna make it. I just wanted to know what you think, what kind of guy he was. Hey man, he was a little kid. He was a kid? Yeah. When you see him, how old was he? He was 11. 11? What was he like, like when he was a little, little kid? He was a sweet little kid. He wasn't violent. And he wasn't bad. The way they got it, the way they talking about now, that's not true. It's not true. Like when you say... Every time somebody say something, they change it around. He was this and he was that, and I know that he was not. Well, what was he like, then? In, in other words, when he, grew, when he was growing up, like, did he have a sense of humor? Yes, he did. When you, how, how did you find out that he, your nephew was killed? What do you mean how I found out well, he was you, killed? Did you get a phone call? No. They just burned the picture here. If I was to see this young man on the street, I've never seen him, right? What, what would I see? What did he look like? Was he a tall fellow? Was he no, short? he was this short. He was very short. To be his age, he was real short. Was he a bright fellow? Was he a smart guy? Yeah, he was very bright and very smart. He can draw, he can read, he can write. What kind of food did he like? I mean, was he... Oh, uh, he loved food, gyros. You know, he, he ate a lot. Mm -hmm. When Mama had barbecues, he ate that. He ate a lot. Why was his nickname Yummy? Because he loved cookies. His nickname was Yummy because he loved cookies? Yeah. What was his favorite cookie? Chocolate chip. Oreo, you know them chocolate chips in the blue bag, that's what he liked. What's your name? My name is Gloria. Gloria, did he have like, when he was growing up, did he have any heroes? Did he have any sports heroes? He well, he liked a lot of like, cars. He liked to fix on cars and stuff like that. Did he ever talk about what he wanted to be when he, when he was growing up? Yeah. Not, not to my knowledge, maybe to my mother, but not to my knowledge. I've been staying around here. How long was that? About a year. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What was he like? Bad. You mean bad? Like when you say bad, what do you mean? Fighting still, breaking the people out. I think you should have asked this question. Yeah? Shut up! What, what Come on, we just open up that door. Did you ever see like the police coming to his house? Every other day. Every other day, the police were coming to his house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
when you like when you found out that he, he was uh killed right what did you think um, I mean, it shocked me. He shouldn't have got killed like that. I mean, he didn't have to die the way he was killed, but that's the life you live. That's what happened. All of you children that are standing here, looking down, take a good look. I want you to say within your heart that you'll never end up like Robin. Okay? Cry if you will. But make up your mind that you will never let your life end in tragedy like this. Okay? Yeah, Roseland, where two kids died this past week and the week before. Two young kids from fairly large families in a not-so-young neighborhood. This has been a big news story, a tragedy covered by media from all over the world. But there's a lot more to this drama than what you've seen, although we know you've seen and read a lot. You knew Siobhan, yeah? She's my niece. She's your niece. Uh -huh. What's your name, man? Ida Falls. What was she like? What was Siobhan like? She was a very cheerful young lady. Beautiful, outgoing. She was a good girl. Real good girl. Full of life and she loved to come outside and play. She loved to do hair. You know, she was beginning to start doing hair. And she loved to see beauty. She liked the likes of beauty, beautiful things. She wasn't a bad girl. How'd you find out about her death? How did I find out? Yeah. Well, I lived just right here. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard two shots. And when I heard the two shots, my two kids was um, on the porch. So I was sitting to the table eating my supper at the time. And I take it and um, ran to the door. And so my daughter said, make, them, uh, make the kids come in. So I told my son and my granddaughter to come in the house. So as they came in the house, I sat back down. So some told me to get up and go look out the window. So I just came to my window right there and looked out. And so I saw my son, you know, pressing back and forth, you know, saying, call the police, call the police. And so then I ran out the back door with my shoes off. And he said, somebody's daughter is laying down here hurt. So, you know, I don't care who child is, I want to help. So I ran out the back door and ran right here. And I still didn't know it was my niece laying down there. And so my brother, he ran out the door, and he, he, he ran right there. And then he, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that he knew it was his daughter. I'm pretty sure that my brother knew what she had on, her clothing. So he ran, and he looked at her, and he put his hand on her and felt her pus. So he said, she still have a pus. So he said, call the police. The police were there so quick. I mean, they was here on the robber. And so um, the police, they came and put white gloves on, and they felt my niece, you know. But I knew, you know, she wasn't going to make it. I just wanted to know what you think, what kind of guy he was. Hey, man, he was a little kid. He was a kid? Yeah. When you see him, how old was he? He was 11. 11. What was he like, like when he was a little, little kid? He was a sweet little kid. And he wasn't violent. And he wasn't bad. The way they got it, the way they talking about now, that's not true. It's not true. Like when you say... Every time somebody says something, they change it around. He was this and he was that, and I know that he was not. Well, what was he like then? In, I, in other words, when he, grew, when he was growing up, like, did he have a sense of humor? Yes, he did. When you, how, how did you find out that he, your nephew, was killed? What do you mean how I found out well, he was you, killed? Did you get a phone call? No. They just brought the picture here. If I was to see this young man on the street, I've never seen him, right? What, what would I see? What did he look like? Was he a tall fellow? Was he no, short? he was this short. He was very short. To be his age, he was real short.
Was he a bright fellow? Was he a smart guy? Yeah, he was very bright and very smart. He can draw, he can read, he can write. What kind of food did he like? I mean, was he... Uh, he loved food, gyros. You know, he, he ate a lot. Mm -hmm. When Mama had barbecues, he ate that. He ate a lot. Because he loved cookies. His nickname was Yummy because he loved cookies. Yeah. What was his favorite cookie? Chocolate chip. Oreo. You know them chocolate chips in the blue bag? That's what he liked. What's your name? My name is Gloria. Gloria, did he have like, when he was growing up, did he have any heroes? Did he have any sports heroes? Did he well, he liked a lot of cars. He liked to fix on cars. Stuff like that. Did he ever talk about what he wanted to be when he, when he was growing up? Not, not to my knowledge. Maybe to my mother, but not to my knowledge. did you know him? Since I've been staying around here. How long was that? About a year. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What was he like? Bad. You mean bad? Like when you say bad, what do you mean? Fighting, stealing, breaking the people out. I think you should have asked this question. Yeah? Shut up! What, what Come on, let's open up that door. Did you ever see like the police coming to his house? Every other day. Every other day, the police were coming to his house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you like, when you found out that Why? he was, he was uh, killed, right? What did you think? Um, I mean, it shocked me. He shouldn't have got killed like that. I mean, he didn't have to die the way he was killed, but that's the life you live. That's what happened. All of you children that are standing here, looking down, take a good look. And I want you to say within your heart that you'll never end up like Robin. Okay? Cry if you will. Cry, <laughs> Make up your mind that you will never let your life end in tragedy like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rosalind, where two kids died this past week and the week before. This two young kids in fairly large families in a not so young neighborhood. This has been a big news story. And to set the record straight, Tupac, this interview is not about your trial, your court appeals. It is about Tupac, the inner man, then and now. Since your period of incarceration at Clinton Correctional Facility, have you taken the time to reflect on your previous lifestyle or specifically your gangster thug image? <laughs> um. I don't see it as me having this gangster thug image. Um, thug life would be more uh, accurate, but it's not an image, it's just a way of life, it's a mentality. Yes, I have taken the time to reflect on it. Um, in my reflection, I don't see it as being wrong, I just see it as being a stage that we all go through. You know, um, it, it's just like that. for. For little white kids and rich kids, they get to go to the military academy or ROTC or they get to take all of this energy and put it into the armed forces. And for a young black male, a young Puerto Rican or Hispanic person, we got to put this in the streets. That's where our energies go. That's the only place we have to put it. So that's where we end up putting it. So that's what I did. I don't feel like what I did was so evil. I just feel like what? The way I was living and my mentality was a part of my progression to be a man. Of Wirecast. Yeah. Uh, surviving several gunshot wounds is a wake-up call and a miracle in itself. No doubt. 
What were your thoughts as you lie in the hospital recuperating from the gunshots? They shot me. Straight up. I just kept thinking, they really did shoot me. I really did believe at one point, up until I got shot, that no black person would ever shoot me. I was their representative. I believe that, um, you know, I, I didn't have to fear my own community. You know, this I was like, um, I represent them. I'm their ambassador to the world. They would never harm me. They would never rob me. They would never do me wrong. But as proven by this false rape charge, as proven by this, the gunshots, as proven by a lot of the comments you read in the news and in the media, that's not true. You know, I'm just one man. So I just thought about how it changed. What would I do? How can I make them sorry that they ever did this to me? You know what I mean? How can I um, come back like 50 times stronger and better? How do you spend your time in prison? Well, the first mm, eight months, I spent in solitude, 23 hours a day, locked down, reading, writing. I wrote a script called Live to Tell. Um, Which what's it's about? It's like a semi-autobiography semi -autobiography on my life. Mm -hmm. Half me, half fiction. It's real good. It's my first attempt at really writing a screenplay. I used to always add things to the, like poetic justice. I wrote, I added my own words to poetic justice. I, mm -hmm. I um, wrote whole scenes in Above the Rim. Mm -hmm. um, this and Juice, I used a lot of my own of words. Wirecast. This was the first time that I actually sat down to write a whole script with characters, real live, leaving ca breathing characters. And so Live to Tell, I did that. Worked out, do a little push-ups, calisthenics. Um, read, I read a lot of good books. I read a lot of Maya Angelou's books. The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Um, listen to music, you know, different types of music, calm my soul. Dionne Farris, she really got me through a lot of this time. Mm -hmm. Does the prison experience provide a source of new material this or inspire your creative sources for a new album? Everybody thought it would, you know? Everybody's like, oh man, he's in jail now. I know you're gonna come out, he's gonna have a bomb album, but it's the opposite. Prison kills your spirit, straight mm -hmm. up. It kills your spirit. There is no um, creativity, there is no, there's none of that. You know, I see a lot of it in other prisoners. Mm -hmm. They got artists in here, they got poets in here, you know, but as far as me, it just killed my spirit. I couldn't write. I only recently started writing, and besides the script, mm -hmm. the script was just like flashing back to my, my old life, so it didn't really take this too much for me to um, be inspired by. But in terms of writing music and lyrics, I didn't have that, I couldn't do it. Now, I just, you know, finished a couple of tracks, so that's good, but um, it, it doesn't really inspire creativity. Is your music a reflection of your true thoughts, life experience, anger, or vision? The music that you recently, especially your Me Against the World album. Me Against the World was all out of my heart. You know, like, as close to telling the truth and selling records as this I could possibly get. Of Wirecast. And um, most of my music is like that. If you look back over past albums, I just try to speak about things that affect me and about things that affect our community. Mm -hmm. And I try to do it from a viewpoint of the watcher. Sometimes I'm the watcher, and sometimes I'm the participant. And sometimes it's just allegories or fables that are, um, have a moral or have... A, a, a theme, underlying theme in it to do it. You know, like my inspiration for writing music is like uh, Don McLean when he did American Pie and he did mm -hmm. Vincent, um, like Shakespeare when he does his things, um, like deep stories, you know, like mm -hmm. raw human needs, Lorraine Hansberry with Raising in the Sun. Mm -hmm. I want to do that to my music. That's how I like to do it. Marvin Gaye, you know. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about some of your lyrics? Sure. That you, that you fear reflect the harsh realities of a young black man living in America, but at the same time, um, in one sense, it offers them hope and respect. No question. Can we talk about that? Yeah. I mean, this is a I don't understand how Dolores Tucker Coast. and Bob Dole and all these other dudes, how they can say, like, we got gangster music. I never even classify my music as gangster music and if you really I know they haven't listened to my tape I know somebody geese them up to go attack Tupac and now what it does is they, they attacked a few famous rappers and now them themselves are famous mm -hmm. Bob Dole want to get elected which he won't be Dolores Tucker just want to get a name which she won't find because it'll fade mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see how she can say she's helping the black community and strike back at us mm -hmm. um, we are the black community <laughs> you know we are mm -hmm. a part of the black community mm -hmm. but as far as the lyrics you can look at lyrics in my album Wire any album and I'll pick out lyrics and and I'll shut them up on all their points. You can look at my recent album, Me Against the World, the title song, Me Against the World, 
where it has lines that says like, um, can you picture my prophecy? Stress in the city, the cops on top of me. The projects is full of bullets, though bodies is dropping. They ain't no stopping me. Constantly moving while making millions. Witnessing killings, leaving dead bodies in abandoned buildings. Can't reach the children cause they illin'. Addicted to killing and the appeal of the cat pillin'. Without feeling, but will they last or be blasted? Hard headed bastard. It's, Maybe he'll listen in this casket. Now how does that glorify thug life or gangsterism? I don't see how that does it. I don't I understand agree. how that, that could be, you. how you can say, you know, we're the cause of all this violence. Is it true that you were born in prison? Not born in prison. My mother was pregnant with me while she was in prison. Mm -hmm. And a month after she got out of prison, um, she gave birth to me. So I was uh, cultivated in prison. My embryo mm -hmm. was in prison. It's obvious in your music that you have a strong reverence for your mother. Tell us about that cast. relationship. It's, you know, that's my homie. My mom's is my homie. We went through our little, our stages, you know, mm -hmm. where first we was mother and son. Then we was, you know, when we was born, it was mother and son. Mm -hmm. Then it was like drill sergeant and cadet, you know. Then it was uh, like dictator, little country. <laughs> 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 uh -huh. After I moved out and I was on my own, came back and was like some prodigal son type of thing. Where now, you know, she respects me as a man. I respect this her as a, mo a um, as a mother for all the things, all the sacrifices she made. So she's really my friend. You know, it's like it's not just me. I think all young black males and all Hispanic males, really all males, period. Mm -hmm. But especially from that ghetto, mm -hmm. that ghetto lifestyle, we have a deep love for our mothers because they usually raise us by themselves. You know, so you always feel closer to your mom. Even back in the day, they had, True. I always love yeah. my mama. It's been going on for years. All right. Do you feel for those mothers who lost their children and babies to senseless gain and youth this violence? Do you have a message of, wire cast. of consolation for those mothers? Yeah, I, I do. Um, like with Yummy, when he passed on, you know, I know that hurt his family. I know it hurt the family of the female he supposedly have, you know, shot. Um, just recently, this lady wrote me named Clovis Benjamin from San Francisco, and um, she's a male woman. And she was writing me, telling me about her son, her nephew, had just been killed. And the day before he went to go, the day before he died, he was like, I'm going to get Tupac's in the tech. So she wrote me to tell me, you know, they played Dear Mom at the funeral, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And that touched me, you know, and I was like, what can I do? Is anything I could do? Let's do some concerts. Let's do some organizing. I was like, if she's strong enough to keep going and make a difference, then I can be strong enough to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And that kind of focuses me back on what I should be doing and not let me like veer off back into the lifestyle I was living because it's real easy to do that. But um, I definitely feel for the mothers. I think that what we need to do as a community is start um, taking control back of our communities. This is you a know, I understand it's always going to be drug dealing. I understand it's always going to be violence, but we just need to regulate it so that we can at least have like a peaceful zone where we can all be cool, you know, mm -hmm. or else we're going to all die. We're going to all be destroyed because soon um, the government is going to make the young black male and the young Hispanic male the prime target of their uh, all their resources and all their jail sentences and all their powerful weapons and technology will be the enemy. So unless we stop it now, regulate it, we're going to end up crashing against the wall. This Has your record company, Interscope, been supportive of you since you're in prison? No doubt. Very supportive. They let me um, pick my songs, pick the singles. Uh, I got another album that I had completed before I went to jail mm -hmm. to keep that hot, keep it, you know, mixing it, getting it ready for release. I'll be releasing another album probably December of this year. Um, they've been real supportive. I, I even had some of them, one of them come up, you know, one of like the top people at the record company come up and see me. They send their love, their support, whatever I need, this money, whatever. So they stay down. That's why I stay there. Okay. Why do you think your album is, is doing so well and continues to do well even though you're in prison? When others who are out here promoting their product, um, and, and, and this is not to cast uh, shadow on any other rapper, but it, it appears that you've become more popular in your music since your imprisonment. I don't think really the album did as good as it could have been doing because I ain't getting no awards. MTV ain't giving no awards, yeah. getting no Grammys, you know what I mean? I think I, I dig real deep with this album. Mm -hmm. But um, 
as far as the success that we do have, I owe it all to my fans. I owe it all to the people who supported me. I think um, the reason being is that in every album, if you go backwards, people are just getting turned on to me. If you go backwards and you listen to the other albums I've put out, mm -hmm. th it was a prophecy. This album, Me Against the World, was made before I went to jail, before I got shot. Mm -hmm. And all I'm talking about is going to jail and getting shot. Mm -hmm. So it was a prophecy. A so when the album comes out, cast. then you hear about what's really going on in my real life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have to say I'm keeping it real. You can listen to the music and go, whoa. You know what I mean? He said that. If I die tonight, mm -hmm. he said that. Um, and Outlaw, where I said some dudes in a mask coming to shoot me, I, I said it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, and um, it ain't easy. I'm talking about being in jail. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the judge not letting me out on bail. I mean, I said all of these things, and then it happened. Um, How many records have you sold to date? Me against over the two world. million. Over two million. We 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 it's going for three million now. Hopefully, three million we can make with the support of our fans. Um, I also feel like it's not glorification. No matter what these people say about me, my music does not glorify any image. My music. It's spiritual if you listen to it. It's all mm -hmm. about emotion. It's all about um, life. And it's, I, with other rappers, not to diss nobody, but where other rappers might, you know, paint a perfect picture of themselves or, you know, whatever, I get, I tell my, my, my innermost darkest secrets. I reveal myself this in every one of my records. From Dear Mama to Shed So Many Tears. I tell my own personal problems, you know, and people can relate to that, I believe. And that's what makes it sell the few copies we do sell. You realize that you have uh, a lot of fans out here, re regardless of uh, what has happened. And even though you haven't won any awards, you have in the hood many fans, and you have uh, many fans across the board, so to speak. This is now, a demonstration of Wirecast. There's, from what I've gathered, there's a public adoration not only for your music, but for you as a person, which I found to be very interesting, uh, set apart from other rappers that I comment on and, and inquire about. Now, and they're all eager, your fans are eager to hear from you in prison. They want to know how you're doing. Uh, just like you receive letters uh, from all over the country. Demonstration of uh, Wirecast. From kids from their parents, and so forth. Um, what kind of message would you share with young people? I know you've, you've commented on gangster rap, and I understand it. I understand where you're coming from with it. But what are your comments on that subject this is a for young people, for your fans, cast. for for eleven or twelve or thirteen year old that listens to your music. First, I'm gonna say, I don't feel all the adoration or whatever that comes from the fans. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a lot of people um, put different standards on judging me than they will put on the next man. You know, one rapper can say, "I'll kill you," "I'll cut your heart out." I put this gun to your pregnant belly and blah, 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 and he get all love. All I'll say is, you know, we don't need to be letting this these BITCHs run our life. And I'm, I'm hating females, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this other person could be the man. So I don't feel it. Um, I've, I think I've been attacked more than I deserve, but that's all good to me. Because mm -hmm. I've I always been a fighter, always been a soldier, always been a struggler. Can't nothing stop me but death itself. You know what I mean? So as far as what, what I have to say to other people, I don't really want to come off like, I got the answer. I'm finna teach y'all. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. I don't got the answers. It's, it's but just from where I'm sitting at, I can see the, the only reason I ever came out and said, when I said I was living the thug life, believe me, it was all real. Mm -hmm. You know, and as sure as thug life is tattooed across my stomach, it will always be a part of me. Mm -hmm. But thug life is like the 12th grade. Some people graduate from high school and don't seek to do anything else. Mm -hmm. So they continually live the thug life. Mm -hmm. Some people want to go to college. Mm -hmm. And um, want to go, hold on, let me pick mm -hmm. up Yummy. Okay. Okay, ready? Roll. Mm -hmm. Some people go to college. Yeah, like high school is thug life. You know, you graduate from, high, from 12th grade. Mm -hmm. And you can live your whole life with a high school diploma. But you're always going to be missing something. That's why I felt like I was. 
thug life is always going to be real to me, and it still is real to me, because as long as the things that, as long as the factors that make thug life are there, thug life will be there. But I also felt like I wanted to go to college, not college in a school or university, but mm -hmm. college in life. I wanted mm -hmm. to move up. So I wanted to do something different. I wanted to expand. I wanted to grow. And that's what this was all about, by saying, you know, no more of that. I want some more of this. I want y'all to see this. You didn't like that? Well, you definitely ain't going to like this. this. Come outside and play. She loved to do hair. You know, she was beginning to start doing hair. And she loved to see beauty. She liked the likes of beauty, beautiful things. She wasn't a bad girl. How did you find out about her death? How did I find out? Yeah. Well, I live just right here. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard two shots. And when I heard the two shots, my two kids was um, on the porch. So I was sitting to the table eating my supper at the time. And I take it and um, ran to the door. And so my daughter said, uh, make, them, uh, make the kids come in. So I told my son and my granddaughter to come in the house. So as they came in the house, I sat back down. So some told me to get up and go look out the window. So I just came to my window right there and looked out. And so I saw my son, you know, prancing back and forth, you know, saying, call the police, call the police. And so then I ran out the back door with my shoes off. And he said, somebody's daughter is laying down here hurt. So, you know, I don't care who child is, I want to help. So I ran out the back door and ran right here. And I still didn't know it was my niece laying down there. And so my brother, he ran out the door and he, he, he ran right there. And then he, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that he knew it was his daughter. I'm pretty sure that my brother knew what she had on, her clothing. So he ran and he looked at her and he put his hand on her and felt her pus. So he said, she still have a pus. So he said, call the police. The police were there so quick. I mean, they was here on the robber. And so um, the police, they came and put white gloves on and they felt my niece, you know, but I knew, you know, she wasn't gonna make it. I just wanted to know what you think, what kind of guy he was. Hey, man, he was a little kid. He was a kid? Yeah. When you see him, how old was he? He was 11. 11. Yeah. What was he like, like when he was a little, little kid? He was a sweet little kid. He wasn't violent. And he wasn't bad. The way they got it, the way they talking about now, that's not true. It's not true. Like when you say... Every time somebody says something, they change it around. He was this and he was that, and I know that he was not. Well, what was he like then? He was going to jail. And then finally I went to jail. Even though I wasn't getting shot up, they was all getting shot up. Then I got shot up. Mm -hmm. I started seeing, damn, you know, it is my fault. It is, it's not my fault where I made it happen, but it's my fault because I'm smarter than that. Yeah. Now, if I was dumb and I was, I ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Now, if I was dumb, it'd be cool. It wouldn't be my fault, but it's my fault because I'm smarter. Come outside and play. She loved to do hair. You know, she was beginning to start doing hair and she loved to see beauty. She liked the likes of beauty beautiful things. She wasn't a bad girl. How did you find out about her death? How did I find out? Yeah. Well, I live just right here. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard two shots. And when I heard the two shots, my two kids was um, on the porch. So I was sitting to the table eating my supper at the time. And I take it and um, ran to the door. And so my daughter said, uh, make them all, make the kids come in. So I told my son and my granddaughter to come in the house. So as they came in the house, I sat back down. So some told me to get up and go look out the window. So I just came to my window right there and looked out. And so I saw my son, you know, prancing back and forth, you know, saying, call the police, call the police. And so then I ran out the back door with my shoes off. And he said, somebody's daughter is laying down here hurt. So, you know, I don't care who child is, I want to help. So I ran out the back door and ran right here. And I still didn't know it was my niece laying down there. And so my brother, he ran out the door and he, he, he ran right there. And then he, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that he knew it was his daughter. I'm pretty sure that my brother knew what she had on, her clothing. So he ran and he looked at her and he put his hand on her and felt her pus. So he said, she still have a pus. So he said, call the police. The police were there so quick. I mean, they was here on the robber. 
And so um, the police, they came and put white gloves on, and they felt my niece, you know. But I knew, you know, she wasn't going to make it. I just wanted to know what you think, what kind of guy he was. Hey, man, he was a little kid. He was a kid? Yeah. When you see him, how old was he? He was 11. 11. Yeah. What was he like, like when he was a little, little kid? He was a sweet little kid. He wasn't violent. And he wasn't bad. The way they got it, the way they talking about now, that's not true. It's not true. Like when you say... Every time somebody says something, they change it around. He was this and he was that, and I know that he was not. Well, what was he like then? In, in other words, when he grew, when he was growing up, like, did he have a sense of humor? She would come outside and play. She loved to do hair. You know, she was beginning to start doing hair, and she loved to see beauty. She liked the lights of beauty, beautiful things. She wasn't a bad girl. How did you find out about her death? How did I find out? Yeah. Well, I live just right here. Mm-hmm. And um, I heard two shots. And when I heard the two shots, my two kids was um, on the porch. So I was sitting to the table to come outside and play. She loved to do hair. You know, she was beginning to start doing hair. And she loved to see beauty. She liked the lights of beauty, beautiful things. She wasn't a bad girl. How did you find out about her death? How did I find out? Yeah. Well, I live just right here. Mm-hmm. And um, I heard two shots. And when I heard the two shots, my two kids was um, on the porch. So I was sitting to the table eating my supper at the time. And I take it and um, ran to the door. And so my daughter said, uh, make, them, uh, make the kids come in. So I told my son and my granddaughter to come in the house. So as they came in the house, I sat back down. So some told me to get up and go look out the window. So I just came to my window right there and looked out. And so I saw my son, you know, prancing back and forth, you know, saying, call the police, call the police. And so then I ran out the back door with my shoes off. And he said, somebody's daughter is laying down here hurt. So, you know, I don't care who child is, I want to help. So I ran out the back door and ran right here. And I still didn't know it was my niece laying down there. And so my brother, he ran out the door, and he, he, he ran right there. And then he, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that he knew it was his daughter. I'm pretty sure that my brother knew what she had on, her clothing. So he ran, and he looked at her, and he put his hand on her and felt her pus. So he said, she still have a pus. So he said, call the police. The police were there so quick. I mean, they was here on the robber. And so um, the police, they came and put white gloves on, and they felt my niece, you know. But I knew, you know, she wasn't going to make it. I just wanted to know what you think, what kind of guy he was. Hey, man, he was a little kid. He was a kid? Yeah. When you see him, how old was he? He was 11. 11. What was he like, like when he was a little, little kid? He was a sweet little kid. And he wasn't violent. And he wasn't bad. The way they got it, the way they talking about now, that's not true. It's not true. Like when you say... Every time somebody says something, they change it around. He was this and he was that, and I know that he was not. Well, what was he like then? In, I, in other words, when he, grew, when he was growing up, like, did he have a sense of humor? Yes, he did. When you, how, how did you find out that he, your nephew, was killed? What do you mean how I found out well, he was you, killed? Did you get a phone call? No. They just brought the picture here. If I was to see this young man on the street, I've never seen him, right? What, what would I see? What did he look like? Was he a tall fellow? Was he no, short? he was this short. He was very short. To be his age, he was real short. Was he a bright fellow? Was he a smart guy? Yeah, he was very bright and very smart. He can draw, he can read, he can write. What kind of food did he like? I mean, was he... Oh, uh, he loved food, gyros. You know, he, he ate a lot. Mm-hmm. When Mama had barbecues, he ate that. He ate a lot. Because he loved cookies. His nickname was Yummy because he loved cookies. Yeah. What was his favorite cookie? Chocolate chip. Mm-hmm.
How long did you know him? Since I've been staying around here. How long was that? About a year. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What was he like? Bad. You mean bad? Like, when you say bad, what do you mean? Fighting still. Breaking the people out. I think you should have asked this question. Yeah? Shut up! What, what Come on, open up that door. Did you ever see, like, the police coming to his house? Every other day. Every other day, the police were coming to his house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you, like, when you found out that he, he was uh, killed, right? What did you think? Um, I mean, it shocked me. He shouldn't have got killed like that. I mean, he didn't have to die the way he was killed, but that's the life you live. That's what happened. All of you children that are standing here, looking down, take a good look. I want you to say within your heart that you'll never end up like Robin. Okay? Cry if you will. Miami. <laughs> Make up your mind that you will never let your life end in tragedy like this. <laughs> yeah, Roslyn, where two kids died this past week and the week before. Two young kids from fairly large families in a not-so-young neighborhood. This has been a big news story, a tragedy covered by media from all over the world. But there's a lot more to this drama than what you've seen, although we know you've seen and read a lot. You knew Siobhan, yeah? She's my niece. She's your niece? Uh -huh. What's your name, man? Ida Falls. What was she like? What was Siobhan like? She was a very cheerful young lady, beautiful, outgoing. She was a good girl, real good girl, full of life. And she loved to come outside and play. She loved to do hair. You know, she was beginning to start doing hair. And she loved to see beauty. She liked the likes of beauty, beautiful things. She wasn't a bad girl. How did you find out about her death? How did I find out? Yeah. Well, I lived just right here. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard two shots. And when I heard the two shots, my two kids was um, on the porch. So I was sitting to the table eating my supper at the time. And I take it and um, ran to the door. And so my daughter said, make, them, uh, make the kids come in. So I told my son and my granddaughter to come in the house. So as they came in the house, I sat back down, so some told me to get up and go look out the window. So I just came to my window right there and looked out, and so I saw my son, you know, prancing back and forth, you know, saying, call the police, call the police. And so then I ran out the back door with my shoes off, and he said, somebody's daughter is laying down here hurt. So, you know, I don't care who child is, I want to help. So I ran out the back door and ran right here. And I still didn't know it was my niece laying down there. And so my brother, he ran out the door, and he, he, he ran right there. And then he, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he said that he knew it was his daughter. I'm pretty sure that my brother knew what she had on, her clothing. So he ran, and he looked at her, and he put his hand on her and felt her pus. So he said, she still have a pus. So he said, call the police. The police were there so quick. I mean, they was here on the robber. And so um, the police, they came and put white gloves on, and they felt my niece, you know, but I knew. Rappers there, the hardcore rappers that they say don't give a, a hell about the community, mm -hmm. and if we could come to them and do the concerts and speak one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. I think that would be cool, mm -hmm. um, because I met a lot of OGs in this jail. This is a demonstration me a of, game, of Wirecast. Of knowledge to move to the next level. I like to do the same thing. I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. So hopefully, you know, that'll be popping. All right. Well, this concludes an exclusive prison interview with rap artist Tupac Shakur. Can I say one thing yeah. before you end? Mm -hmm. A lot of people have been giving me mad flack about the Stug Life thing. I just wanted to clear something up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
Thug Life, I've been getting the blame is a demonstration for everything of Thug Life ever did. Everything, anybody can say Thug Life, and then it, it always comes back to me. I done had policemen get killed, and I get blamed for it, and, you know, all type of violence, and I get blamed for it. And I want to say that, you know, I didn't create Thug Life. I diagnosed it. You know, mm -hmm. just like if a doctor says, this is the AIDS virus, mm -hmm. he didn't make AIDS, he diagnosed it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I he won't be held responsible for every AIDS case. Mm -hmm. You know, if anything, he's bringing you information on maybe finding a cure. I felt as though that's the this same thing I did with Thug Life. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. magazine when I said Thug Life is dead. That does not mean that Thug Life is dead in the world. That just means that I have graduated to the next level to be a player. Mm -hmm. Not a player of females, but a player of life. This mm -hmm. game of life is a game, mm -hmm. and you have to play it to the fullest. Mm -hmm. And um, I graduated, you know, I'm in college now, the college of life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I want my brothers to graduate too. I could easily just look down on you and go, the mother is stupid, you know what I mean? I know something now they don't know, but that mm -hmm. ain't me, that ain't never been me. When Thug Life was not out there, and I was this pumping it to you, I wanted you to know what it was like. And now I want you to know what the next level was like. So I had people telling me, you softened up, ain't nothing soft about me, ain't nothing changed. Um, if anything, I feel like the other dudes is soft because they out there fronting. Mm -hmm. They watching they watching little kids get killed and they still talking it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's cool to talk about it, to recognize it, but I mean, how many times can we say the same thing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, I know it's a way for us to get out the hood, but what are we running to? You know what I mean? Once we get out the hood, shit, this they don't want us over there. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. You know what I mean? And, um, and also, for the people out there, we need to start supporting not every black person that go to jail or go, get into trouble, but the ones that you know didn't do it. Exactly. You know what I mean? I feel yeah. like people know mm -hmm. I didn't do this. They saying right now, they still say Tupac Shakur, rape charge. I'm, I'm not convicted of no rape charge. I want to make that real clear. My, my charge was um, sexual abuse, forcibly touching the buttocks. That's what they charged me. I'm innocent of that. But that's what I'm of wire cast. You understand? Mm -hmm. um, and we just got to be smarter and sharper, or they're going to start taking away each and every person that steps forward to do anything positive for the community. So that's why you be wondering why everybody want to live a negative lifestyle. It's safer. And the community don't support us when we do step out and take bullets for y'all. So can we look forward to some very positive things from Tupac Shakur in the future? Oh, no doubt. You can look forward to me doing movies, writing movies, starring this in movies soon. I want to direct them. You can look forward to me doing records, bringing on a whole bunch of groups. I already got a few now. I just signed a Death Row Records. Mm -hmm. um, I got Fatal and Felony. I got Dramacidal. Thug Life is coming back. My albums, I should be doing a couple more. Um, the movies. And what about the community? I got a community project that's in the works right now. I just met with Al Sharpton, mm -hmm. Malika Shabazz, Malcolm X's daughter, a whole bunch of teachers and educators and community workers, mm -hmm. and we're just gonna start slowly but surely taking our communities back. This so it's not is like I'm just judging and Wirecast. doing lip service. I don't care if don't nobody never support me no more. I'm doing this for self. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I'm saying is that uh, measure a man by his actions fully from the beginning to the end. Don't take a piece out of my life or, or a song out of my music and say this is what I'm about because you know better than that. And if you take me out the game, mm -hmm. you're not going to want to see the next one. Trust me. Take me out the game, you're not going to want to see this next dude because he ain't going to have no compassion. Okay. This is a well, demonstration of Wirecast. And don't come to jail. This is a maximum facility penitentiary. Do not come to jail. Do everything you can to, uh, to make it around the system, over the system, or in the system. Mm -hmm. But don't come to jail. It's not the spot. There's little 17-year-old kids up in here, you know what I mean, with 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds. and I'm, a, I'm surrounded by, I mean, you know what my crime is. I'm here one and a half and four and a half. I'm surrounded by dudes doing life at 60 years that's as young as me or younger, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, that made a mistake when this they was young a kids. And they of wire having, cast. You know what I mean? And, um, we so can do something about it. Is this your message to uh, the youth of America, or is this about not coming to jail? I mean, of course, that's, that can be for anybody. That's just plain out, period. Don't come to jail. Um, I'm, I'm a messenger. You know, I come and I bring, I tell you what's going on. If I went to a club, I'll tell you the club is popping, or the club is sorry. I mm -hmm. came to jail, I'm telling you straight up, this ain't the spot. 
It's dirty, it's filthy, it's like you you an animal. This is a demonstration you know I mean? of wire um, cast. And it's just not the spot. No man don't want to be here. No man or woman wants to be here. So if there's a way that you can get out of the game before it's too late, get out the game before it's too late. If you're gonna be in the game and you commit yourself fully, then you know, do what you can to give back to the community that you rape it. Well, my brother, I hope that this interview will enlighten a, a lot of your well, particularly the youth. They ain't gonna be enlightened. Why not? They ain't this gonna listen. This is a demonstration of they wire have to cast. To somebody. I didn't listen. I didn't listen until I came here. Mad people was telling me, watch out, look out, signs up ahead. I was like, yeah, I got this, I got this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I hope they listen. Don't, they under, don't listen. underestimate the youth of America. Oh, no, I got mad props in them. I'm, yeah. I was one of them, but I'm just telling you yeah. what's real. You know what I mean? Okay. A hard head make a soft behind. It took five bullets for me to stop and see what was really going on. Well, we're going to play this. And we we're need gonna, to. We're going to play this interview. And we're going to see to. if they pick up this on it. This is a we're demonstration of Wirecast. Okay. And I hope they look out for the next projects, the community projects, the albums, the movies. You know what I mean? All I'm saying is that, you know, I'm giving it my best shot mm -hmm. to do right by the community. Y'all do right by me. Mm -hmm. Support me, I'll support you. If I feel like I ain't got no support, then, you know, ain't no need me being out here putting myself on Front Street. If I feel like I'm getting supported, I go all the way. Just like I went all the way for Thug Life, I go all the way for the community. But as soon as y'all turn y'all back on me, I turn my back on y'all. We won't have nothing to talk about. You know what I mean? I go ahead and do something crazy. This is a demonstration Cut my nose of Wirecast. You know, bug out. But um, y'all support me, I don't think support so. y'all. <laughs> now you know I ain't gonna go out like that. <laughs> I'm just saying. But I, I also want to thank everybody for doing Temptation, the video for me. All the people that supported me, Tony Danza, mm -hmm. that wrote me, and all the people that wrote me, you know, mm -hmm. the mothers, the, the kids, everybody that wrote me. I really do appreciate it. I'm sorry I can't write everybody back, but I do feel it. And um, you'll get my answer in the albums. Thank you for granting us the interview, Tupac. So thanks for coming, man. You got me out of my cell. We on lockdown this right now. Some kids just got murdered. We can't even move. No, no food, no, no yard, no programs. We stuck in our cells. So it was good I could get out for a hot second. Okay. And especially, you know, find out I can get this bizarre ready to hop out, you know. Mm -hmm. And look for death row in the future. We finna come out pretty Did tight. You no question. Sign with death row. All right. Um, Ever since I met you, I could peep the pressure. It's like your man don't understand. This All he does is, is stress you. I can see you stay the misery from the introduction. Ain't about no sucking the touching. Just on this discussion, maybe we could see a better way, find a brighter day. Late night phone conversations, would that be okay? I don't want to take up all your time, be the next in line. Tell me your size, let me find some things with you in mind. I can see you cautious and I'm careful not to scare you. The anticipation of love making got me shaking when I'm standing near you. Moves of precision will prepare you. In case you get scared, just ask the man in the mirror. Now the picture's getting this clearer. All he does is sit of your I tell you to leave him. And you tell me, keep my faith in God, I can't understand it, I just want to take you home. I wonder, should I leave you alone, find a woman of my own? All my homies tell me that you don't deserve it, I contemplate. And in my heart, I know you worth it, tell me, can you get away? Can you get away? This is a demonstration of Wirecast. It be my destiny to be lonely. Ain't checking for these hoochies that be on me cause they phony. With you is different. I got no need to be suspicious. Cause I can tell my life with you will be delicious. The way you lick your lips and shake your hips got me addicted. I'm sitting this here hoping that we can find some way to kick cast. it. Even though I got your digits, gotta struggle to resist it. I slowly advance till it's my chance not to miss it. You blow me kisses. When he ain't looking at your heart's took it. My only wish is that you change your mind. 
around and hang your shit. Wanna take you there, but you're scared to follow. Come see tomorrow, hoping I can take you through the pain and sorrow. Let you know I care, and someone's there for your struggle. Depend on me when you have needs or there's trouble. I want to give you happiness or maybe even more. I told you before, no time to waste. We can look up at the store and get away. I can't. Can you get away? They're reminiscing, and I hope you're listening. In the position of pressure and awkward composition, this me and you was meant to be my destiny. Cast. No longer lonely, cause now it's on for you and me. All I can see, a happy home, that's my fantasy. But my reality is problems with your man and me. What can I do? Don't want to lose you to the sucker. But if you touch it, I got some drama for that buster. Don't want to rush it, but make your mind up fast. Don't want to know some who controls, will it last? Before I ask, I hope you see that I'm sincere. And even if you stay with them till they, I'm still here. I refuse to give up, cause what I'm this even- This is a demonstration of Wirecast. I'm living Wirecast. in prison and what he's given ain't compared. Cause everything I've given for you was <laughs> passionately yours and I'll never let you go. Tell me, can you get away? Straight. This is a demonstration of Wirecast.
died at the hands of members of his own gang. That's according to police who discovered his body Thursday morning in a Southside viaduct. A 14-year-old juvenile is in custody. So is 16-year-old Craig Hardaway. Both are charged with first-degree murder. 
hierarchy members in the gang felt that uh, Robert Sanford had brought a lot of police heat on the on the community, and that they felt that with his arrest, they may have been implicated in some way. Police say Sandifer shot 14-year-old Siobhan Dean on Sunday. Dean got caught in gang crossfire near her home. Sandifer's family maintains the boy's innocence, especially his grandmother. What was the problem? They couldn't find my son. But under 72 hours, they supposed to found uh, two suspects supposed to have been Robert's murder. This is a so why they didn't have a mass a hunt on them? The many gifts and messages left by people in front of Sandifer's house attest to their love for the boy who died violently. Family members now have one request. Now I need this here to go further down to more investigation of Robert's murder because I want to know and I would like for other people wants to know too because there's other kids out here in this world is going through the same thing. God to take out of the world the soul of this our deceased son. We therefore commit his body to the ground. Those of us that are alive and remain shall be caught up together. And therefore, I can't you no more, forever. standing here, looking down, take a good look, and I want you to say within your heart that you'll never end up like Robert. Okay? 
cry if you will. <laughs> Make up your mind that you will never let your life end in tragedy like this. <laughs> Okay, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Hardaway had little to say in court, but the teenager's attorney had a lot to say about the way Hardaway was treated while in custody. He's upset about his treatment in the police station. Uh, when he was arrested, etc. But other than that, uh, he seems like the ordinary teenager to me. Howard maintains Hardaway and his 14-year-old brother are innocent. The two are accused of murdering 11-year-old Robert Sandifer last week. Police speculate the brothers took the youngster to the viaduct and killed him on orders from top gang leaders. The Hardaway brothers have had numerous run-ins with the law. At the time of his arrest, Craig was facing a juvenile charge of attempted murder on another case. His brother has two pending cases, one for criminal trespass and another for possession and delivering a controlled substance. Family members in court today say the boys were nice kids who helped out the family. He's just a normal, average little boy, normal, average person. He's sweet and caring and sensitive around me in the house. The boy's father did not want to go on camera, but says his sons dropped off Sandifer on 108th Street and never saw him again. The father insists the boys were home the night of the incident. He recalls the time, 11.30 at night. He says he remembers because his wife was watching her favorite television program. At the criminal courts building, Elio Montenegro. It's the same thing every day. And I ain't expected to happen to my child, but I know I'm sick of it though. In a neighborhood residence compared to a war zone, nine-year-old Joe Lewis Orr was shot and killed as he played in the backyard of the housing project where he lived. Police say one man got out of a car going westbound on 46th Street and began running east through this field, firing five or six shots over his shoulder. Police believe the suspect may have dropped his weapon as he ran, but trained search dogs found nothing. A friend of the nine-year-old who watched him get gunned down says this block is a deadly place to be. How do you feel living here every day? Like I'm old in prison or something. All I do is shoot every day. You can't, you can't walk around to the store without hearing shots. Police say rivalry between a gang living in a high-rise CHA building near here and a gang living in these low-rise CHA buildings has heightened lately. And that this shooting is most likely a product of that tension. Police have been out here many times in the past, but say getting residents to help with the gang crackdown is difficult because of the fear of retaliation. This evening, armed with a description of the car and a suspect, they canvassed the area, trying to find bullet casings or anything else that would help them solve the latest murder of an innocent child. It's always like hell. It's never no help. It's the same thing every day, every single day.
Sandifer died at the hands of members of his own gang. That's according to police who discovered his body Thursday morning in a Southside viaduct. A 14-year-old juvenile is in custody. So is 16-year-old Craig Hardaway. Both are charged with first-degree murder. Hierarchy members in the gang felt that uh, Robert Sanford had brought a lot of police heat on the, on the community and that they felt that with his arrest, they may have been implicated in some way. Police say Sandifer shot 14-year-old Siobhan Dean on Sunday. Dean got caught in gang crossfire near her home. Sandifer's family maintains the boy's innocence, especially his grandmother. What was the problem? They couldn't find my son. But under 72 hours, they supposed to found uh, two suspects supposed to have been Robert's murder. So why they didn't have a mass hunt on them? The many gifts and messages left by people in front of Sandifer's house attest to their love for the boy who died violently. Family members now have one request. Now I need this here to go further down to more investigation of Robert's murder because I wants to know and I would like for other people wants to know too because there's other kids out here in this world is going through the same thing. Almighty God to take out of the world the soul of this our deceased son. We therefore commit his body to the ground. Those of us that are alive and remain be caught up together. <laughs> to baby, baby. And therefore, we shall forever be in the Standing here, looking down, take a good look. I want you to say, 
within your heart that you will never end up like Robin. Okay? Cry if you will. But make up your mind that you will never let your life end in tragedy like this. Okay, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Hardaway had little to say in court, but the teenager's attorney had a lot to say about the way Hardaway was treated while in custody. He's upset about his treatment in the police station uh, when he was arrested, etc. But other than that, uh, he seems like the ordinary teenager to How me. Was he Howard maintains Hardaway and his 14-year-old brother are innocent. The two are accused of murdering 11-year-old Robert Sandifer last this week. Police speculate the brothers America. took the youngster to the viaduct and killed him on orders from top gang leaders. The Hardaway brothers have had numerous run-ins with the law. At the time of his arrest, Craig was facing a juvenile charge of attempted murder on another case. His brother has two pending cases, one for criminal trespass and another for possession and delivering a controlled substance. Family members in court today say the boys were nice kids who helped out the family. He's just a normal, average little boy, normal, average person. He's sweet and caring and sensitive around me in the house. The boy's father did not want to go on camera, but says his sons dropped off Sandifer on 108th Street and never saw him again. The father insists the boys were home the night of the incident. He recalls the time, 11.30 at night. He says he remembers because his wife was watching her favorite television program. At the criminal courts building, Elio Montenegro. It's the same thing every day. And I ain't expected to have to my child, but I know I'm sick of it though. In a neighborhood residence compared to a war zone, nine-year-old Joe Lewis Orr was shot and killed as he played in the backyard of the housing project where he lived. Police say one man got out of a car going westbound on 46th Street and began running east through this field, firing five or six shots over his shoulder. Police believe the suspect may have dropped his weapon as he ran, but trained search dogs found nothing. A friend of the nine-year-old who watched him get gunned down says this block is a deadly place to be. How do you feel living here every day? Like I'm old in prison or something. All I do is shoot every day. You can't, you can't walk around to the store without hearing shots. Police say rivalry between a gang living in a high-rise CHA building. Covered by media from all over the world. But there's a lot more to this drama than what you've seen. Although we know you've seen and read a lot. You knew Siobhan, yeah? yeah. Ida Falls. 